Acorn, and let me make sure I've got the name right, but I believe they were Acorn Micro uh, prior to being ARM. And they did um, various controllers and then got into RISC machines, which stands for Reduced Instruction Set. Um, but it doesn't actually have anything to do with the number of instructions. It has to do with how fast they can be run and uh, the simultaneous nature and stuff like that. But basically what ARM is, is a 37, and I haven't gotten a way to get this statement out that sounds great. It's 37 register, uh, registers of 32 bits, and that's your register file. I guess that's pretty close. And what that is, is it basically just acts um, as a whole series of blocks that you can store information in of various forms. So you'll see uh, somewhere up here, yeah, you'll see I initiate a whole series of these things. You've got a bunch of different ones, user, abort, um, system, fix, service, IRQ, undefined. And these basically are overlapping sets of these registers. Now, I've got them set to 31 just so I have some extra space. In actual terms, it's about 17 or so registers per uh, group. What happens is these registers overlap with one another to varying extents. So, for example, you'll have a user file which has its set of registers, and then you'll have your ABT file, which you'll see, let's see here, yeah, so you'll see here where we get into this, you, I'm basically just copying over um, values in one register to another because you have these different modes that you go into that change the register that you have access to. Um, I guess maybe I should start with asking, do you all know what a register does? I'll take that as a no. Okay, so you've got a set of memory, right, which has a whole bunch of uh, data in it. And what the register does is takes uh, sections of this memory and stores it. And it's uh, in the form of binary numbers or hex, you know, whatever it is you want to think of it as. Um, and each register, in the case of ARM, can hold a 32-bit number. So these, these numbers are taken from memory, stashed in these register locations. Now, the reason that these seven, I think it is, different modes overlap is that if I'm a user uh, and I've got a series of data here and I have some situation come up where I need to switch to the abort mode, but I don't want to lose all of this data, but I need to uh, perform a special set of commands that isn't present in this. So each of these registers is basically a command. That 32-bit number is a command that tells you what you're doing. The, the abort register will have a certain number of these that are in common so that it has access to the same data, but will have a different set that are not the same so that it can perform a special set of uh, operations without losing whatever data is already in user because this data in user will allow you to go to different locations in your program and do things like that. Um, let's see here. As we kind of get through, I think some of this will get more clear. Um, basically how this all works though is since you've got a register, you've got a memory, what happens is you load from your file on your computer into your memory and then ARM is a load store architecture. So that means essentially what you do is you load commands and then you store commands. You load and you store, you load and you store. And the way this is done is there's various what they refer to as pipelining uh, mechanisms. Now, most ARM, there's a whole lot of versions. This version that I'm working with uses a three-stage pipeline, which means it has a fetch stage an execute stage, and I forget the term they used for the last one, fetch, execute, and, um, or, I'm sorry, uh, fetch, it's like, I can't remember the word, it's not translate, but essentially you um, 
figure out what it is, parse it, and then you execute. And it just keeps doing this over and over and over again. Now, there's a little more to it than just grab, translate, execute. But essentially what you're doing is you're fetching from memory an address specified by whatever's in your registers. You translate that message out, figure out what the command it's telling you to do is, execute that command. That'll have you do a series of manipulations on either the register or locations in memory, uh, various things like that. So what we'll do is I'll go down to our main loop down here so you can kind of see how this flows. ARM has some pretty interesting things. So we'll take a real simple example instruction to start with, like add, and work our way back. Yeah, here we go. So here you'll see we've got an add instruction. Now, in your register, your 32-bit number, you have a series of fields. For sake of keeping it simple, we're not going to label them all today, but you've got a condition field, which in ARM allows you to conditionally execute instructions. The reason that's important um, <coughs> has to do with a, a variety of different things, but the simplest example is that say you write a for loop, and inside of that loop you have an if-else statement. Traditionally, the way you would execute that is with some branching around if and else, which would um, set up a series of conditions and things like that that you would do in your assembly. And it's, it gets to be a little bit complicated. What this allows you to do is set a series of flags so that this flag says, I execute if I'm less than. And then there is a program counter which has a series of flags in it as well that match or don't match with this. So if I get whatever this command is and it comes in, I can conditionally execute. So rather than saying, if less than do some series of things, I can encode the less than in my instruction so that I don't have to write two stages to that instruction. I can write one stage and then if these match, it runs. If it doesn't, it doesn't run. So that's one of the ways that uh, ARM is faster than a lot of other microcontrollers because that capability, while it, it exists in others, um, ARM really does a good job of it with that aspect. Um, the next really interesting thing about the way ARM handles these kinds of things is it has what they call a shifter operand. Now, What the shifter operand allows you to do is encode a lot of different manipulations to your data in the instruction itself again. So that rather than having to say, let uh, only execute this instruction if it's less than some number, and go to and then having another thing that says, you'll get your second operand or whatever it is your instruction is, you'll get a piece of that from this location, you can encode that information in your shifter operand. So an example of that would be you've got your memory, and it's a big area with a bunch of addresses in it that you go to. You jump to different locations to take the instructions from. What this will allow you to do is they use what they call a barrel shifter, and they pass this chunk of your uh, uh, instruction into the barrel shifter. And then that takes the information here and the form of your instruction and performs a series of manipulations on it. So in the case of an add instruction, uh, is there an eraser? So in the case of an add instruction, what you'll see is you've got register RD, so destination. If your condition is passed, 
So if we conditionally execute this instruction, your destination register is set equal to what they refer to as a first operand plus a second operand. So this second operand, this first operand is just taken straight from a register. In this case, that's what this RN is, it's register. Um, the second operand here, the shifter operand, is this portion here that I've labeled shifter operand. Before you get into the instruction, but after you have parsed out the instruction, you pass this portion as well as the entire word into the barrel shifter. And so for example, in this case, it might be add two to three, right? But the compiler is not necessarily gonna know that you want three to be the second number unless you either A, tell it implicitly, you know, you're adding three. Or if you can give it some location to reference in memory which contains that piece of information. So what the, the shifter will allow you to do is make that reference locate, that memory reference, without actually implicitly telling it anything. And the way it does this is kind of a complicated process, but basically, if this is our barrel shifter, it comes in and goes, what kind of addressing mode are we in? And there's a whole series of addressing modes. Um, there are, I believe, five basic addressing modes, each of which has anywhere between four and 11 different processes that it will do on your shifter. So in the case of add, add is what they refer to as a data processing instruction. This includes add, add with carry, and subtraction, reverse subtraction, sort of all of your really basic data um, processing instructions. So that has 11 different ways that it will manipulate based on the form of the 32-bit word which you are executing at the time. Um, so in the case of add, we send add through, and this is where we'll hop into the barrel shifter, uh, and we'll go down to my excellently named do data proc. And you'll see that there's a couple of different things you can do. There's immediate, there's immediate shift, there should be a rotate somewhere in here. Uh, arithmetic, yeah, it's shift rights, rotate rights, all of these different things you can do, which form values that you can uh, then use as your second operand in the add instruction. So we've done one where we've just pulled a value straight from a register, and then we need to know what that second is. So what we do is we pass the whole word into this barrel shifter, and it goes, okay, I know based on the form of the word that this is a data processing instruction. <coughs> So now what I do is I go through and I check and I parse some of this out ahead of time. But if, for example, based on the form of the word, it's a 32-bit immediate, then what I do is I take the shifter operand and I set it equal to a rotated right version of an immediate eight. Uh, and they, they, it, it's a, an eight-bit immediate, essentially, a value that is also encoded in the shifter operand. And I think we defined it, yeah, extract. So these are the last seven bits of the instruction is this immediate eight. So what it does is it rotates this right by a value also encoded in the shifter, oper uh, the shifter operand times two because it makes it, uh, it keeps it word aligned, which we won't really worry about. But essentially what that does is it allows you to form from seven bits and from Where's our rotate immediate? Yeah, and then from four bits. So basically, from these 11 bits, you can form a 32-bit number. And that's all encoded in one 32-bit instruction. So that what you're actually able to do is encode in this single instruction a first operand, a register location, a second operand, the shifter, which can take on a different form depending on the form of the instruction, which can be either, in this case, as we've sort of talked about, you've got the immediates, there's 
immediate shifts and all of these different uh, manipulations you can do. But basically, I mean, you can already see we've got two 32-bit numbers just from this one form encoded. Actually, I mean, three, really, if you think of the register that you're pulling a value from, all encoded in this one instruction. So that's really the big reason ARM is awesome, is that's really dense. I mean, that you, you know, you talk about efficiency, that's a dense instruction. You've got three 32-bit pieces of information encoded in one 32-bit number. And that's not even counting some of the other things that are in here. I mean, there's all these different flagging mechanisms that allow you to update or not update and all of this kind of stuff. Um, Let's see, sort of moving along here. Is there anything, I guess I'll ask a real quick question of you guys. Is there anything like you would really like to know that you don't know about these kinds of things? Because I'm just kind of going through examples of why it's cool. I would ask a question of thus far. <clears throat> what I get so far is that it's almost like the way that you look at prologue versus a sort of uh, language like C. Um, it's almost like you have to put a lot more thought into what you're doing, but then the, the flexibility or the, the power of it sort of is sort of manifested that way. Yeah. Um, um, through those like one like careful instruction. I would be inclined to agree with you. You know, except because it's you know it's it's running compiled code. Right. You know, it's sort of it's like, like the architecture level now we're talking. Yeah, about. exactly. But uh, you know, I, I I definitely would agree with you. You do have to be careful and specific because it's so powerful. You know, you you really have to make sure that you've encoded things correctly. Um, maybe a little bit more discussion of how the. Yeah, you know, my other question was to clarify technically. It sounds like so what it's doing is like so in a in x eighty six you'd have like a one to one. You'd have like. You'd have an immediate um, opcode. You'd have a, a, a register-based opcode. You'd have a, um, and then you'd have a, um, you'd have a like storage <coughs> that will fetch from memory. But this, it sounds like, what you're doing is you're using the shifter operand to pass it to the barrel, which will like basically, if you can pass flags and say what mode you're in, and that's how it handles to know what kind of operands it's fetching. So it's like almost really flexible. Like it can, yeah, you can almost pack multiple commands into one command. Well, that's, that's when I talked about that loop earlier, right? So an example, and this is something that I just was goofing around and saw on Wikipedia that they give, is um, again, going to that if else condition, right? You can encode all of that in three commands. You can encode the loop, the if, and the else, all in three commands. In other forms, it takes a lot more instructions. And you can execute a lot of these things in far fewer cycles because of that. So you can do in one cycle on this ARM processor things that might take you two or four cycles in others. Um, yeah, and that's, that's because of this encoding. So this really lets you just go, bam, because all of that information is slammed into this one thing. So it's not even architectural preference. It's actually something that it comp you're sacrificing uh, simplicity for speed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it's, it's a complicated architecture. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the way the control flow works uh, for a second here. So when you look at the register file, you'll see that you've got you know, all of these different registers. And there are a couple that are of particular importance. Um, there's a PC program counter. There's a CPSR, central program status register. And there's an SPSR, saved program status register. Now, the PC is common across all of the different modes. So you can access, if you'll recall, we've got six or seven, I uh, can't remember off the top of my head here, different uh, um, processor modes that it can be in. There's the user, the IRQ. They'll have different uh, access to system resources, um, different things like that. The PC will be common amongst them all. PC is the thing that tells you where in memory you're going. That tells you the current location in memory. CPSR, Central Program Status Register, is the thing that has all of these flags that I was talking about set in it. 
and also has a series of other things, but we're not really going to worry about them too much at the moment. So that's what you would check your conditions against. You know, am I less than? Nope, okay, I don't execute. Am I greater than? Yes, okay, great, I execute. Whatever it is, that's checked against the CPSR. The SPSR holds um, in the case, is important for branching and things like that if you need to perform a subroutine. So you need to skip from wherever location you are in, uh, currently in memory and go you know, 100,000 addresses south and uh, memory to run a specific subroutine. The SPSR allows you to copy what you currently are doing into a safe location, do your subroutine, bring that back over, and still be back where you were. Um, so that kind of, I don't know, maybe gives a little more context to some of these conditional <coughs> execution and things like that, where the idea is that as I switch modes, and let's just say these are two versions of our register, we maybe have these in common, right? But these are all different. What that allows us to do is perform a whole series of instructions on these data. So if we're in this mode, I can manipulate all this. And these will be manipulated as well. But this one, this stuff gets left alone. And we don't lose that information, um, which is pretty important, again, for this branching and linking concept. Um, I think, I mean, we can keep talking, I guess, about how it goes through this stuff, but I, I don't know, I've opened it up again. Is, is it almost like it's like a function point in a single call, and then it sort of jumps through like a stack almost, like by the architect, through the architecture? Uh, like that's what I'm getting out of, you have the half shaded and half not. Yeah, I mean, you can think of it, I guess you can think of it as a stack. The thing that I'm mostly trying to get across is just the flexibility of this format. Go ahead, Campbell. So, um, this is a little off, off the subject, but uh, I've been cross-compiling for, for ARM, and what I've realized is that there seem to be different, maybe, dialects. Yeah. Because it, um, you know, it, it, it seems when you're using x86, like one version of x86, if you have an x86 machine, it works. Yeah. But say I accidentally cross compile in the compact version of ARM, it, it doesn't work for an Android. So the other thing that's cool about ARM is they've got, I've been talking about this 32 bit mode, right? They've also, where all of your registers are 32 bits, they've also got a 16 bit version called Thumb which is an instruction set that is more or less one-to-one -one mapped with the 32-bit instruction set. So it, it's essentially the same commands. However, you get rid of a lot, not all, but a whole lot of the various manipulations you can perform on your shifter operand. So you remember how I said in data processing, you've got 11 different barrel shifter manipulations you can do to form that second operand. In the thumb state, you maybe only have two. You maybe only have three. You have a whole lot fewer. So what that does is it allows you to condense a lot of that code down to 16 bits from 32. Um, now, you know there are things you wouldn't want to do this on and stuff like that, but that's probably what you're running into is that you're you're compiling maybe for thumb and the transition. It works as long as you're not using any of this special data. Uh, because you lose that data if you're using it and you're in thumb mode. Um, the reverse isn't as true because you can pretty much cover most of the thumb stuff, but the thumb, the thing that's cool about thumb is it condenses even further the number of cycles it would take to run something. I don't know offhand what the increase in speed is, but it's pretty significant, and it's one of the major reasons um, that ARM is as popular in embedded electronics as it is. I think it's like 90% of the embedded electronics market is ARM. Um, and that's just because it's tiny, it's really low heat, it requires very limited power. Um, and as you can see, you can encode so much information in a single instruction that you can reduce those cycle times. And that leads into that lower heat, that 